Good morning. Welcome again to Morning Devotions. I'm Pastor Samuel, the pastor of the Cathedral of Praise. And we want to get right into Psalms 129 today, so let me start with Psalms 129, verse 1, New Living Translation. From my earliest youth, my enemies have persecuted me. Let all Israel repeat this. From my earliest youth, my enemies have persecuted me. But then look at this next phrase. But they have never defeated me. Wow. Now, brothers and sisters, sometimes, sometimes it seems that enemies just don't ever give up on you. But I want you to notice they never defeat us. He said, my back is covered with cuts as if a farmer had plowed long furrows. But the Lord is good. And he has cut me free from the ropes of the ungodly. Ah. Here is an attitude toward God when persecuted. Now, now brothers and sisters, this is, this is important. Because sometimes when you've got people who hate you and people who are always fighting you, and forgive me, my back is covered with cuts as if a far, farmer had plowed long furrows. In other words, these people have had an impact upon your life. These people have hurt you. You don't start to go, God, where are you? You go, but the Lord is good. But the Lord is good. Whatever people are doing to you in life, you keep a good heart toward God, Deba. May all who hate Jerusalem be turned back in shameful defeat. May they be as useless, I like that, as useless as grass on the rooftop, turning yellow when only half grown. So they start to die before grown. Ignored by the harvester, despised by the binder, and may those who pass by refuse to give them blessing. Now, this is basically what he's saying. He's saying, you know what? These people that are always attacking me, he said, may they be as useless as grass on the rooftops. He said, may everything they set their hand to just die before it even begins to grow. He said, you know, don't get yourself so focused on these people because, number one, they're useless. And he said, number two, they're going to die out before they get strong. So don't get yourself too upset by these, these people who are always attacking you. Useless as grass on the rooftops, turning yellow when only half grown, ignored by the harvester, despised by the binder. And may those who pass by refuse to give them a blessing. They're not going to be people that others look at and put blessing on them. Just don't worry about it. You focus on, but the Lord is good. This, this, If you're going through hard times right now, that's what you focus on. But the Lord is good, and he will cut me free from the ropes, or he will rescue me from the ropes of the ungodly. The Lord bless you. We bless you in the Lord's name. Beloved, some of you are going through some hard times right now in your offices. I, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's swimming with the sharks. It's grabby, cutthroat going on in the offices. Some of the members, they share with me some of the things that are going on. When times get hard, people get desperate, and desperate people do desperate things. But beloved, you keep it in your heart that the Lord is good. You keep it in your heart that the Lord will rescue you. You keep it in your heart that these people will never defeat you in Jesus' name. That they will wither away before they can ever get strong. Everybody will look upon them as useless. You just focus on God and being productive in Jesus' name. Father, I lift you, my brothers and sisters, that are going through difficult times right now. They're going through very hard situations, Father, with things that they don't even begin to understand why they're so hated. But Father, I ask that you'd make your goodness so real to them. Father, in the midst of it all, let them see your hand delivering them. Let them taste and see that you are good in the middle of it all. Lord, prepare a table for them in the presence of their enemies. <laughs> oh, yes, Lord. Lay out the blessings for them right in the presence of their enemies as you have promised. Father, I thank you for it. 
Be the lifter of their heads, Lord, and let your blessings come upon them. I thank you for it, Father. And now, Lord, I lift you all of our people right now. Crown this year with your bounty. Father, let this be a season of promotion and increase. Let this be a season of sales. Let this be a season of long overdue debts being paid. Father, let this be a season of great financial harvest. That, Father, all the seeds they have sown, this is their harvest season. And I thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open up our hearts and spend some more time in worship now.
we're going to go through together and we're going to read a few chapters together from Ezekiel this morning. Now, as we read together, we're going to start in Ezekiel chapter 40 in verse 1. So let's grab our Bibles and open them up. In the 25th year of our exile, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was struck down, on that very day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me to the city. In visions of God, he brought me to the land of Israel and set me down on a very high mountain. Now we're going to be talking about the temple as we move forward here. On which a structure, like a city, to the south. When he brought me there, behold, there was a man whose appearance was like bronze with a linen cord and measuring reed in his hand, and he was standing in the gateway. And the man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears. Set your heart upon all that I show you, for you were brought here in order that I may show it to you. Declare all that you see to the house of Israel. And behold, there was a wall outside the city of the temple area. And the length of the measuring reed in the man's hand was six long cubits, each being a cubit and a hand breadth in length. So he measured the thickness on the wall, one reed, and the height, one reed. Then he went into the gateway facing east, going up to its steps, and measured the threshold of the gate, one reed deep. And the side rooms, one reed along, one reed broad, and the space between the side rooms, five cubits, and the threshold of the gate of the vestibule, of the gate of the inner cord, one reed. Then he measured the vestibule of the gateway on the inside, one reed. And then he measured the vestibule of the gateway, eight cubits, and its jams, two cubits. And the vestibule of the gate was in the inner end. And there were three rooms on the side of the gate. The three were the same size, and the jams on either side were also the same size. Then he measured the width of the opening of the gateway, ten cubits and the length of the gateway, 13 cubits. There was a barrier on the side rooms, one cubit on either side, and the side rooms were six cubits on either side. Then he measured the gate from the ceiling and one side of the room to the center of the other. The breadth of 25 cubits, the opening, faced each other. He then also measured the vestibule 20 cubits, and around the vestibule of the gateway was the court. From the front of the gate and the entrance to the front of the inner vestibule of the gate was 50 cubits, and the gateway had windows all around, narrowing inwards toward the side rooms and towards their jams. And likewise, the vestibule had windows all around inside, and on the jam were palm trees. Then he brought them out to the outer court, and behold, there were chambers and a pavement all around the court. Thirty chambers faced the pavement, and the pavement ran along the side of the gates corresponding to the length of the gates. This was the lower pavement. Then he measured the distance from the inner front and the lower gate of the outer front of the inner courts, a hundred cubits on either side and on the north side. As for the gate that faced towards the north belonged the outer court, he measured its length and its breadth, its side rooms three on either side, and its jabs and its vestibule were the same size as those on the gate. Its length was fifty cubits and its breadth was twenty-five cubits. And its windows and its vestibule and the palm trees were the same size as those of the gate that faced towards the east. And by seven steps, people would go up to it and find a vestibule before them. On the opposite of the gate of the north, on the east, was an inner court. And he measured from gate to gate a hundred cubits. And he led me toward the south, and behold, there was a gate on the south. He measured its jams and its vestibule, and they had the same size as the others. Both it 
and its vestibules had windows all around, like the windows of the others. Its length was fifty cubits, and its breadth twenty-five cubits. And there were seven steps leading up to it, and its vestibule was before them. And there was a gate on the south of the inner court. He measured from gate to gate towards the south, a hundred cubits. Then he brought me to an inner court through the south gate, and he measured the south gate. It was the same size as the others. Its side rooms and its jams and its vestibules were the same size as the others, and both it and its vestibule had windows all around. Its length was fifty cubits, and five cubits broad. Its vestibule faced the outer court, and the palm trees were on its jams, and its stairway had eight steps. Then he brought me to the inner court on the east side, and he measured the gate. It was the same size as the others. Its side rooms and jams and vestibules were the same size as the others. And its vestibules had windows all around. Its length was fifty cubits and breadth twenty-five cubits. Its vestibule faced the outer court and had palm trees on its jams. On either side, and its stairway had eight steps. Then he brought me to the north gate, and he measured it. It had the same size as the others. Its side rooms, its jams, and its vestibules were the same size as the others, and it had windows all around. Its length was fifty cubits, and its breadth was twenty-five cubits. Its vestibule faced the outer court, and it had palm trees on its jams. On either side, and its stairway had eight steps. There was a chamber with its door. To the vestibule of the gate, where the burnt offering was to be washed, and in the vestibule of the gate were two tables on either side, on which burnt and sin offerings and the guilt offerings were to be slaughtered. Off to the side, on the outside, as one goes up to the entrance of the north gate, were two tables, and off to the side of the vestibules of the gate were two tables. Four tables were on either side of the gate, eight tables on which to slaughter. And then there were four tables of hewn stone for the burnt offerings, a cubit and a half long, and a cubit and a half broad, and one cubit high, on which the instruments were to be laid, and with the burnt offerings and the sacrifices were slaughtered. And hooks and handbreadth long were fastened all around within, and on the tables the flesh of the offering was to be laid. On the outside of the inner gateway were the two chambers in the inner court, on the side of the north gate facing south, and on the other side of the south facing north. And he said to me, This chamber that faces south is for the priests who have charge over the temple, and the chamber that faces north is for the priests who have charge of the altar. These are the sons of Zadok, who alone among are the sons of Levi that may come near the Lord to minister to him. And he measured the court, a hundred cubits long and a hundred cubits broad, a square, and the altar was in front of the temple." Now, something that you can see as you go through this chapter, you can see how God is so specific about the temple, so specific about the sanctuary, that there are measurements, there are plans when you are doing things for God. It's never just do it as you like on the spot. God is a God who plans. He has points. He has structures. He has things that are laid out for specific purposes. Purposes to take care of the people and to give him honor and to give him glory. With open arms unto his face He looks at me with love in his eyes And takes me to his close embrace Now I'm taking back 100 score to a tie Still I'm broken, binding man's soul of him For me this is no token He took my place, he took my shame and bled and died for me So cool 
little hip, safe for shame. I thank God for Calvary. The stress and the grief, the disincarcerated, the same of them like me. Then they took him and they beat him while they cut his back and people raised. Crucified, put him in his holy grave. He was stretched and abused and a hammer to some wood. Struck with a blade of pain, it was all for my death. Soon take this place of praise the one who came and made us free. Look around, view his grace and see. I thank God for Calvary. Calvary, oh Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Calvary. I thank God, I thank God for Calvary. Calvary, oh Calvary, Calvary. 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 Oh, I thank God, I thank God for Calvary. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. Now the family all knows this prayer just done for the story goes on for kids with the truth of God's own son see the end no longer flowed and the heart no longer beat but then Satan shook he was feeling the heat yes, oh. Oh. on the third day as promised from his God to give us away from the sins As we turn our attention today again to 1 Peter, we're going to pick up in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Now, Peter starts out, likewise, wives. He didn't say all women. He said wives. Be subject to your own husbands. Ladies, you don't have to submit to every pair of pants that walks down the street, but submissive to your own husbands. So that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of of their wives. Now here's a while, ladies. Here's a while. Without a word, by the conduct of their wives. Now I've seen this work both ways in my life. I've I've seen unsaved husbands who had no desire for God at all. And I've seen wives just, ta, 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 just preaching at them every single day about what a horrible heathen they were. And you know what? They never got saved. And I've watched wives 
live a godly life before their husband. Not be scared of sharing the gospel, no, but live a godly life before their husbands. And I've watched those husbands. I'll never forget the first time I saw it as a young intern pastor. I asked him why he got saved, and he talked about how as mean as he was to his wife trying to get her to break. She wouldn't. She was just sweet and kind and wonderful. Until she heard him praying one morning, kneeling beside the bed, Lord, help me be as good a husband. Help me be the kind of a husband that my wife deserves because she's such a good wife to me. And you know what, ladies? That's, that's Bible. That they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see you respectful and pure conduct, wow. When they receive the holiness of your life, they also see how you treat them. That you're respectful to your husband. Hmm. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the wearing of gold, or putting on of clothes, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Now, well, let me just add one more thing and then we'll talk about it. This is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands. Now, ladies, you're going to have to understand something. All that beauty fades. I don't care if you're the most beautiful woman in the world. You're going to get wrinkles, <laughs> okay? The, the physical beauty is going to fade. But there's an inner beauty that only grows stronger. Now, I, I talked with a man one time who had made some mistakes in his life. And he committed adultery and started a second family, and he was now getting right with God. And I looked at him and I said, but you have a wife who's incredibly beautiful. Why in the world would, would you do this? And, you know, to be honest, the, the number two, she didn't look that nice. And I said, you have this beautiful wife, and yet you go start a relationship with this lady who's not that attractive. And he looked at me and he said, but I like the way she treats me. Wow. He said, the way she treats me is what, is what got my attention. Now, ladies, you're going to have to understand something. There's something far more seductive and there's something far more beautiful than physical appearance. You adorn yourself with a gentle and a quiet spirit Submitting to your husband. I said, Pastor Summerall, that's very misogynist to say, I'm just teaching you the Bible, all right? And I've met enough men in my life to tell you it's true. Because ladies, the physical beauty always fades, always does. I mean, we, we get older, okay? But that gentle, quiet spirit, that submissive heart with your husband, that will keep attracting him for the rest of your life. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now, another translation of that said, don't fear your husband when he's frightening. All right. So, ladies, you, you should never be afraid of your husband. OK, just keep doing good. Now he talks to the husbands. All right. So we've talked to the wives. Now we talk to the husbands. Have you ever noticed how God's pretty even handed? Husbands. Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you in the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Wow. All right, now notice, gentlemen, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel. Now, guys, you have to live with your wife in an understanding way, not a dominating way in an understanding way, not with domination, not with control, not with lording it over her. Always try to understand your wife. Guys, you're going to have to learn. Ladies think different than men, okay? Ladies don't think like a guy. Now, guys, as the head of the house, you have to try to understand your wife. Showing honor to the woman. Now, now guys, again, you always honor her. Wow, I like that. 
you always show honor to the woman. You carry her heavy bags. You open doors for her. That, that's not kawawa. I mean, I, I, there was a guy one time who started saying that that uh, a guy helping his wife and showing honor to his wife, that it was kawawa for him. You know what? When a guy acts like that, he's just a jerk. Okay, guys, are you man enough to show honor to your wife? <laughs> when you're in public, do you honor her? Do you step back and let her? Take the lead. Wow. Do you remember when Bradley Knight and his wife were with us and, and she was doing the ladies' conference? I, I sat there in the front row and watched Bradley. It's one of the reasons I like Bradley so much. I watched him be willing to sit back and let his wife be the one who was getting all the attention. It was a women's conference. She was speaking. But he's always the one who's Bradley Knight, Bradley Knight. But he was so willing to step back and allow his wife to receive the honor. And he showed her honor. I thought, ah, now there is a good, good man. When a man can't step back and let his wife receive honor, and can't step back and show his wife honor, uh, he's a pretty weak man. Showing honor to the wife as a weaker vessel. Since they are heirs with you in the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. All right, guys. Here's the truth to answered prayer. You live with your wife in an understanding way, showing honor so that, and we need to really highlight that, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. All right, all of you. All right, this is how we live with each other. Unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil. Here's a do not. Do not repay evil for evil. Reviling for reviling. Now the translation says insult for insult. Have you ever had people to sit around and insult you? You know, there are some people, every time they get around you, they just want to insult you. And all that you, you go someplace and all you hear is all these horrible things people have said about you. You know what? You don't need to to retaliate in kind. If, if, if people have been saying all kinds of insults about you, well, you know what? People believe what they want to believe. I, I wouldn't bother responding to that. So never repay evil for evil. When people do evil to you, just, okay. I can't change how you treat me, but I can act. choose how I act. And never repay insult for insult. But on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Wow. This is how you reap blessings. Bless, for to this you were called. We were called to bless, not to go around and insult. Whoever desires to love life and see good days. All right, now, is that what you want? So you determine quality of life. You determine the quality of life. Whoever desires to see law, to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. All right, so there's two truths. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit because that's going to affect your quality of life. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. All right, so there's three, there's four, there's five, there's six. There are six things that determine your quality of life. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. I like that. God is watching us, not from a distance. God is watching us. And his ears are open to our prayer. God is watching and God is listening. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for doing good? If you are zealous for doing good. Who is there to harm you if you're zealous for doing good? But if you suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. All right. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Okay. Now, great truth there. We will suffer. Okay. This is just something that we're going to have to face. We will suffer for doing good. You know, sometimes you do the right thing. And you know what? You're going to suffer for it. 
<laughs> my father used to have a saying, and I don't like that saying, but my father used to have a saying, no good deed goes unpunished. You know what? Unfortunately, in this world, it's too often true. But in your hearts, regard Christ the Lord as holy, always, okay, this is how you regard Jesus. Jesus is holy. Always be prepared to make a defense, be prepared to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Always be ready to make a defense. Always be ready to share the gospel. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Now, again, this is how to witness. We should never witness with, with meanness and disrespect. You dirty sinner. That should never be our attitude. We should give an answer for the hope that is within us, that, that we have a confident expectation of a future good because of who we are in Christ. So we answer that with gentleness, respect, a good conscience, because they will slander us and they will revile. They will insult our good behavior. You know, sometimes the young people say, you know, pastor, people make fun of me because I'm a virgin. One of the guy, young men was telling me that he's mocked in his call center because he's a virgin. Well, they'll revile your good behavior in Christ. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Okay, I mean, you will suffer for doing evil, but if you suffer for doing good, if that's God's will, it's okay. For Christ suffered once for sins, that's all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. We've dealt with all of that in Romans, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Uh, that's one of those question marks in my Bible. I've read lots about it. I've studied lots about it. I still don't have a good answer for you. Because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. God's patience waited. Wow. While the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Okay, if you're not baptized, you need to understand that's part of your salvation. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, there's something beautiful that happens when you're water baptized. It's a, like a resetting of the human conscience. It's not just a, a spiritual ritual. When things are done properly with the right heart, it's a real reality in resetting the conscience who has gone into heaven, who is at the right hand of God. All right, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? He's gone into heaven at the right hand of God with the angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Jesus is Lord. Let's get for some wisdom today into the book of Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs 25 This great truth here for us today. Like cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Have you ever been really hot? Like right now, it's really, really hot. And if you notice how good, just cold water, I mean, forget Coke, forget a, forget a Frappuccino, just nice cold water. Lots of ice cubes. <laughs> I like it. Forgive me, I like lots of ice cubes. My wife, my wife laughs at me, but I love lots of ice cubes. Like cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. A muddied spring or polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. Wow. When you back up from wickedness, never back up from wickedness. Because you're like a muddied spring, you're a polluted fountain. In other words, people went to you. They went for hope. They went for water. And they found none. Now, some of you, you've grown up your whole life in the city, so you won't get this. But some of you, like me, you spent years of your life in the province. 
Have you ever been really thirsty? And you know they got these nice springs that just come out of the ground. And if you're out in, in the working in the woods and things, you and you're thirsty. You know, in the old days there was no bottled water. You, <laughs> there was no bottled water. You you cupped your hands. You found a, a spring and you cupped your hands together and you you drank out of the ground. You drank out of the spring or what was coming out of the rocks, and it was good and sweet water. But have you ever gone to do that and you you put it up and you begin to smell it and you immediately go, whoa, I, I shouldn't drink that. Just from the smell as you got it close to your mouth. That's, that's like a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. You go there looking for hope and immediately you're repelled by it. It is not good to eat too much honey, <laughs> nor is it glorious to seek one's own glory. All right. It's not good to eat too much honey. Not too much sweets. Got that? Now we all like sweets, Diva. It's not good to have too much honey. Now honey is good, but you can't have too much. It's all right to have a candy bar once in a while. It's right, all right to have some suman once in a while. But um, not too much or you get too big, Diva. Nor is it glorious to seek one's own glory, new living. And it's not good to seek honors for yourself. It's always best just to step back. And if honor is going to come, let it come from someone else. But don't don't go don't go seek the title. This is modern marketing. How do we promote you? How do we get you in front of everybody? How, how do we make everybody look up to you? How do we sell you? Well, it's not glorious to seek one's own glory. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. A person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. There's no protection. You have to learn in life to have self-control. Yes, use your anger as a tool to control an out-of-control situation. Yeah, I get that. Jesus did it. But you have to learn to stay in control. Not too happy. Not too angry that you lose control. Not too sad. Not too grieving that you lose control. Every emotion can go to the extreme. You have to learn self-control. Because when you don't have self-control, there's no protection in life. Now, young, young people, listen to me for just a minute. This is the reason why everybody wants you to drink. This is the reason why a guy wants to take his girlfriend out and get her drunk. She's got no more self-control. This is why a businessman wants to take you out and give you a few drinks before you sign contracts, because you won't read the fine print as well. You, you've lost self-control. Alcohol reduces your inhibitions. It reduces your self-control. Now, beloved, if you're going to live a long life and be happy in this earth of Jesus tarries, you must learn self-control. All right, we're going to stop there today. We'll see you at 7.